ask you a few spiritual questions. In Isaiah chapter 36, the Bible says this. Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defense cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem unto King Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool and the highway of the fuller's field. Then came forth unto him, Elohim, Dilhah's son, which was over the house, and Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, Asaph's son, the recorder. And Rabshakeh said to them, Say ye now to Hezekiah, Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein you trust? I say, sayest thou, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Lo, you trust in the staff of this broken reed. On Egypt, whereon if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust in him. Would you bow your heads this morning? Heavenly Father, Lord, you have given a word for us this morning. Lord, through your conviction and through your might and through your power, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, walls and chains have been broken here at this altar this morning. But Lord, you are not done. Lord, you are just beginning to work in our lives. And Lord, there are some that have felt the tug of the Holy Spirit in their lives this morning this service already, but can only be released, only have those walls broken down and those chains broken by hearing your word. So Lord, we come to you right now. We honor you right now because nothing, not the songs, not the music, <coughs> Not the teaching, not the person, not the praise is as, as important as your word. Lord, open our eyes. Open our hearts, Lord Jesus. And let us receive your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray and the church said. Amen. Amen. Children can go to children's church. The nursery is open. While the children are exiting, look at your brothers and sisters and say, Good morning. Tell them you love
God has never given up on you, though you've given up on family members, and they've given up on you. God has never given up on you because he loves you. Amen. He loved you so much that he died for you. Mm -hmm. He died for you. Amen. He loves you. Sennacherib sent some men out, some emissaries, sent them out to talk to the people. To talk to the men that were on the wall in the walled city that Hezekiah was in. Because they had heard that Hezekiah tried to hire some people from Egypt, the king of Egypt. He had heard that they had tried to hire them to fight with them against Assyria and against Sennacherib. And the question I'm going to ask you this morning, can I ask you a serious spiritual question? Is this what are you leaning on? When I was in school, we used to play tug of war. Anybody ever play tug of war? Just raise your hand. <clears throat> it was great when you were winning. And it was great except for one point when you were winning, you know what would happen? You'd get a point, and the, <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the cord, you know, in the middle that would hang down, and the flag would be on your side, and then the person that was against you or the people that were against you, they knew they were going to lose, so you know what they did? They just let go, and you fell down on your butt. That wasn't so much fun. <clears throat> I mean, you had the pride of winning, but what you were leaning on, the, the, the strength and the power that you were leaning on was suddenly gone, and then you did what? You failed. There are some here this morning that have leaned on their jobs, and their job has failed you. There are some here this morning that have leaned on family, and family has failed you. I'll talk to them this morning. There are some here this morning that have leaned on their best thinking, that have leaned on their friends, and all of the above have failed you. Amen. Listen to me very carefully. People will fail you. Amen. Jobs will fail you. Amen. Your bank accounts will fail you. And oh, just amen. A big amen. amen. The economy will fail you. Right. Your government, no matter who's in power, no matter who's voted in or who's not, will fail you. Amen. But God will never fail you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. God will never leave you alone. He Praise will never forsake you. Oh, let me tell you something today, church. I've leaned on people and they have failed me. It's not that they wanted to a lot of times. Family, not that they have meant to, but understand this. They're human. They're flesh. And they will fail you. Amen. It's not that you're not loved. It's not that you're not cared about. But let me tell you this. This church will fail you. But God will not fail you. <laughs> Amen. God will not leave you. That's right. Some of you are so down and so tired of being failed by people and places and things. Some of you are into a depression. You just cannot see your way out to where in the morning you hate getting up. And there may be one thing that you're getting up for. Just that one thing. I want you to understand this. God did not come so you have a life like that. Amen. God did not come so that you be down and miserable and depressed. God sees every tear you've cried. He knows you. And He loves you. And He's telling you this morning, He will not fail you, Brady. Let me tell you something. He is so powerful. He is so wonderful. And it doesn't matter if you live here or on the other side of the world. He still loves you as much and he will not fail you. Amen. You see, I don't believe some people are convinced of that this morning. Or, you may be convinced of that, but it hasn't made it to your hands or to your mouth. Amen. So I'm going to give you a chance real quick. I'm going to say it one more time. God will not fail you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Just a show of hands. Raise your hand if God has failed you. Now raise your hand if God has never failed you. I've told you this story before and it bears repeating. Loneliness is a terrible thing. Tammy, loneliness is a horrible thing. Loneliness is a thing, Brian, that you can't get away from. It's something that you cannot run from. It's something that is there from the time you wake up in the morning to the time you go to sleep, and sometimes you even dream about being so lonely. 
Talk to me today, church. You'll understand the Holy Spirit's here this morning. Amen. And the Bible says, even though I may not know your condition, and I may not know what you're going through, the Bible says in the book of Daniel, there's a God in heaven that revealeth mysteries. And we can be surrounded, we can be in a crowd of people, we can be so lonely. Yep. We can be so lonely because there are things that are going on in our lives, in our minds, thoughts that nobody will ever know, and our hearts going on that nobody will ever know about, but God knows. And because we can't tell anybody, and because nobody will ever know about it, nobody will ever know the hell that's going on in here. Amen. We feel lonely. Amen. We feel lonely because we've leaned on people before. Sennacherib said this. He said, Hezekiah, what are you thinking? He said, you think you're going to lean on Egypt? That Egypt's going to come and save you? He said, as you lean on him, he said, it's going to be just like a reed. It's going to break off. and going to pierce your hand. The very thing that you lean on is going to hurt you. Amen. Oh, that's even more lonely. Talk to me now. Amen. But the very thing you had some hope in, the very person, the very church, the very friend that you had some hope in, has now hurt you. It feels like you went from loneliness to loneliness. Amen. I've told you this before and I'm going to tell you again because as many times as God gave me the ability, I'll tell it. Taken away from my family, put on the other side of the world, told I was going to be there for 13 months without my church, without my family, without my friends. My heart was broken. I was broken. Brian, I had people I had to leave, but I was broken. How am I going to leave when I need leaving myself? And I thought it was going to be okay because where the company was staying, at least we were able to get a hold of our families. And then two days into it, they pulled me out of there and put me on an outpost that had nothing. I'm living in a bunker with sandbags all around, dirt everywhere, and this is my life. Take it from the arms of my wife, and my daughter, and the love of my church, my family, with nothing, and loneliness crept in. And Satan waits for times like that. <clears throat> Satan waits for times like that to where when you're at your lowest point, that's where he comes in and he tries to hurt you even more. When people have forsaken you, they've forgotten about you. That's when Satan comes in and he says, now they're right for me to hurt even more. Amen. And the only thing I knew to do, the Bible says, train them up in the way they should go and when they're old, they will be part from it. Amen. I believed in God, I've been in church all my life. And it's funny how God kept on coming to my mind. I wasn't hearing sermons. The only radio sounded like you caught a cat in the door. I'm serious. Five times a day, I don't even know what they were saying. No radio, no nothing. But there was something going on in my heart, Alan. And the Lord was waiting. He was waiting for me to give it to him. He was waiting for me to lean on him because I was at the other end of that rope and I had already fallen down. And he was waiting. He was waiting on me to give it to him. He was standing there with peace. They said he was standing there with happiness for me. He was standing there with joy and hope. And he was waiting. And I went for a walk. We had to have blackout lights because we were getting watered and stuff. I had this little red lens and I'm walking up through there. And somebody, I said, where's, where's the chaplain? Where's the chaplain? They're like, well, the chaplain's out somewhere. The chaplain wasn't even around. Are you kidding me? The man of God was when I needed him. <laughs> Selfless. Somebody pointed me to a corner of darkness. I said, okay. Couldn't see anything. I looked around. Couldn't see anything, couldn't see anything, couldn't see anything. And finally, I took my little red lens and I showed it up and it hit one of these big barriers that had dirt all in it and it had a red cross, not the red cross, but a red cross painted on and an arrow under it. <laughs> and in the middle of my despair, in the middle 
of my loss because my daughter, she's growing up without me. My wife, she's, she's you know, living our life, having to take the responsibility on herself. In the middle of all of these things, there was a crack in the door and a little bit of light shone in. And something in my heart turned over a little bit. And so I walked down this little narrow pathway. I saw my light up again and there was another cross. And it pointed this way. And as I looked to my right, there was a door with a cross on it. And there was light coming around the edges of the door. It was a plywood door. And I remember grabbing that little handle. They'd take a piece of plywood. They'd take a bottle of water. They put rocks and sand down in it, and they take a string and put that over a nail and hook it onto the door to where you pull the door and it shut itself. And we grab that old string handle and open it. And I looked in, and there were three little pews, a wall full of Bibles, and a cross on the table in the front. And the doors started coming open, and the lights started coming in here. And I told God when I thought of that place. I told God when I thought about that trash can that is Iraq. I told God when I thought about the smell. I told God about the loneliness in my heart. I told God about my life going on without me and why he had pulled me out of there and why I was here and I did not understand. I did not get it. And I just confessed. And what I was doing that whole time, I didn't know it, but I started leaning on the Lord. Amen. I started casting my cares on him because he cares for me. And when I got done, I was on my knees at one of those little pews. And I felt like somebody, let me rephrase that, I knew God had reached down. And he had taken a thousand pound weight off my shoulder. He said, you are free. Amen. <laughs> let me tell you something. I got up from there and I walked out of that little room a free man. I was free, hallelujah, because I started leaning on God instead of leaning on something that was going to fail me. Instead of leaning on my best thought, on my way to fix things, I started leaning on Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something, I haven't stopped leaning on Him since. Can I get an amen? amen? Whatever you're leaning on this morning, lean on Jesus Christ, the Bible, the psalmist, the man that was after God's own heart, described it like this in Psalm 31 and 3. He said, for you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Not for this church's sake. Not for that church's sake. Not for denomination's sake. He said, for your name's sake. Amen. Lead me and guide me. Let me tell you something. It wasn't praise uh, this denomination, praise that denomination. It wasn't praise this church or that church. It wasn't praise this friend or that friend. It wasn't praise this family member or that family member. When I knelt down at that altar to pray, it was praise the Lord on high. Amen. For he has come down and he delivered. Amen. Oh, give him praise. Church. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Number two, the question I have to ask you. Number one, what are you leaning on? Number two, who are you listening to? And everybody said, oh me. Oh me. Well, oh you then. <laughs> Verse number seven says this. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, this is the, the ambassador of the evil king talking to him. Is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away? And said to Judah and to Jerusalem, You shall not worship before this altar. Now therefore give pledges, I pray to you, to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses, if you be able to, on your part, to set riders upon them. How then will you turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants, and put your trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? And, and, and I now come up without the Lord against the land to destroy it? The Lord said unto me, Go up against this land and destroy it. That might seem confusing to some. Go back to verse 7. Let me tell you what's going on here. But if thou say to me, we trust the Lord our God, he's saying, listen, your king, Hezekiah, is saying, we trust in the Lord. And this guy said, you say you trust the Lord, but your king has torn down all of his high places. You see, what this king didn't know was that those high places were not anointed of God. And when Hezekiah became king, he said, no, we're going to worship God where God said to worship God in the temple. Tear down these false altars. Tear down these false idols. I'm done listening to them. Amen. Oh, my. Go to verse 8. Now, therefore, 
hundred pledges, I pray that my master of the king of Assyria, and I will give thee two thousand horses. He says, if you'll do this, I'll give you a couple thousand horses. And then he was smart enough, like he said, if you're able to put anybody to sit on them, if you've got anybody that's going to find them. See how Satan does. Verse 9. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants? He said, you can't even fight the least of my master's servants. And you put your trust in Egypt. There are a lot of voices in our lives. There are a lot of voices telling you a lot of different things. The question I have for you is who are you listening to? There are friends, we call them friends, that will give us advice on, hey, listen, you need to follow your heart. That's the most damnable doctrine I've ever heard in my life. Amen. I, listen, <clears throat> I've heard people on talk shows say that when I was following my heart. The Bible says the heart is wicked and deceitful. Who can know the heart? Only God. It's not about following your heart because what you're talking about is your emotions. You're following your emotions and your emotions tell you this and your emotions say that. But who are you listening to? When I was a kid, I loved to play in mud. And at about eight years old, I was playing in mud one day. And my mom got a hold of me. Amber, she grabbed the biggest switch I've ever seen in my life. And it was green. Yeah. Not, not one of those brown ones that'll break. Yeah, it was green. And she busted my hind end. Well, the next day, it rained again. And there was more wood. And she said, Jimmy, do not get in that mud. I said, okay. I was out there. And I was playing on the road. We had some driveway. I was playing on it, and I was jumping over the mud holes. And I was jumping over the mud holes. I was jumping over the mud holes. Not playing in them, playing around it, but not playing in it. Because that's where I get the spanking. My sister came outside. Now, to this day, my sister will tell you that I believe that it was God speaking. But I did not. I knew she was speaking. However, I wanted to jump in the mud hole. And I heard a voice. One crying in the wilderness, saying this, Jimmy, jump in the mud puddle. <laughs> I knew it was her, but I could tell Mom that I heard the voice of the Lord. And she could not whip me because I heard the voice of the Lord. Light bulb. <laughs> so, I said, what, Lord? And the Lord spoke again in the voice of my sister. Weirdest thing. Jump in the mud puddle. And my sister enjoyed seeing me be. And I said, yes, Lord. <laughs> I'm nasty again. Mud went everywhere. Oh, I not only jumped in that mud puddle. But there were about eight of them in a row. I jumped in the next one and the next one. And I said, man, I got nasty. I went inside, not all the way there, on the porch. And my mom met me at the door and said, what did I tell you? I said, Mom, the Lord told me. It was okay. She said, that's a lie. And she got the switch and busted my hind end. <laughs> Isn't it funny, Brian, how a lot of times when we want to do something, oh, you know what I'm calling when we want to do something, we want to act in a certain way, the Lord speaks to us. But the Lord sounds a whole lot like us. Can I get an amen? Amen. The Lord sounds a whole lot like my voice when I want to do something. Talk to me. Amen. amen. There was a man who was a comedian by the name of Flip Wilson back some years ago. Some of you remember him. And he had a saying. He said, the devil made me do it. But my Bible tells me that when we sin, we are drawn away by our own desires. Satan can influence you, but he can't make you do anything because the Bible tells me that I have power over him. He can't make me do anything. So what he does is he plays on my desires. I don't feel like being around people because I'm down and I'm depressed. I don't feel like talking to people because I'm down and I'm depressed. I don't feel like going to God's house. I don't feel like praising the Lord. I don't feel like preaching a sermon because I don't feel a certain way. And the voice I'm listening to is the voice that's in here. And the voice I'm listening to is the voice from down there. Be 
because of this. Now listen closely. Satan's plan is that I don't be around, I'm not around people that love God. Because if he can keep me away from people that love God, when I'm going through things, they're going to give me godly advice. And I'm going to pull out of that depression so that when I talk, I'm not going to talk about my depression. I'm not going to talk about the bad things that are going on in my life. But rather, I'm going to talk about Jesus Christ and he's going to get the glory. Satan doesn't want that. So if he can keep me down and depressed and he can keep problems all around me, guess what I'm going to talk about? Not God. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If he can keep me out of his house, he can keep my faith low because I'm not hearing the word of God. And you know what he'll even do? He's tricky like this. He'll even allow some good things to happen. I've seen people that decided to not be in God's house. That they've had the best day ever. As a matter of fact, there was a pastor one time that decided to go golfing on Sunday. He called his associate pastor and he said, hey, uh, <coughs> I'm not feeling too well. And Charlie said, okay, I'll preach. You're the associate pastor. You're the good guy. You're crazy. <laughs> so the pastor decides to go out and start golfing. Well, God was standing there with one of his angels and he was watching him. Angel's like, Lord, are you going to let lightning come and strike him? I said, Lord. And just said, well, what are you going to do? He said, watch. Pastor teed up on the first one. Pull him one from the tee. I was like, yes! Goes to the second hole. Hold him one. Third hole. Hold him one. He shot nine holes of golf. Hold him one. He said, I'm going to stop right now. I'm going to play 18. I got nine holes. I'm, I'm stepping off. They put his name on the board in the place. I mean, it was just great. He goes home. Angel looks at God and says, what are you doing? He said, how are you going to let him have the greatest name he's ever had? And he laid out of your house. And he's the pastor. God looked at me and said, who's he going to tell? <laughs> who's he going to tell? Who's he going to brag to? Who's he going to tell? He had to confess stuff inside all of his life. Ain't it amazing? There are voices in our heads that, that pull us this way. And the best thing to do is do what you need to do. And the best thing to do is do what you need to do about this. And do what you need to do about that. And here's a self-help book. And, and here's my ten reasons of, of solving this problem. And here is this way and that way. Let me tell you something. If you're listening to any other voice, those voices will eventually take you down, down, down. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, there is a way that seemeth right on a man. But the end thereof is destruction. Right? There's a lot of ways to seem right in here. The Bible says the end thereof is destruction. How many have created a lot of the, most of the problems that you faced? How many have created those yourself? Yeah, you're not alone! But God's voice has never been silenced. God's voice is still speaking to you. Amen. As a matter of fact, you heard it this morning when you came to his house. Amen. No, no, hear me out. You see, some people say, well, I don't hear God's voice. I, I wish you would just tell me. He is. Do you think that we were born into sin and then a great thought just popped in our head to do a godly thing? No. The Bible says all things good come from the Father of life. So guess what? When you decided to be in God's house this morning, it was God speaking to you. You know what he was telling you? I love you. Oh, Brian, you felt it. Alan, you felt it. I love you. Amen. Come to my house where there's freedom. Come to my house where you can learn of me. Amen. Come to my house where you can take that thousand pound burden off your shoulder and lay it on an altar and get up a free man. Get up a free woman and have a great, great life. This is what God's telling you. Because he loves you. The question is, who are you listening to? And sometimes it's not the voices around you. Sometimes it's the voice in you. And we got to measure that voice up with God's word. Number three, where are you finding your strength? Number one, what are you leaning on? Number two, what are you listening? Who are you listening to? And number three, where are you finding your strength? Verse eleven says this. Then said Elakim. And Shebna and Joab unto Rabshak, I speak, I pray you, 
unto your servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it and speak not in the Jews' language in the ears of the people who are on the wall. But Rabshak I said, has my master sent me to make your master, and do you speak these words? Has he not sent me to the men who sit upon the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own urine with you? Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Syria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present. Come out to me, and eat ye every one of his own wine, of his every one of his vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one of the waters of his own sister. Until I come and take you away into a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread, and you say you'll paint a pretty picture. And that's what he was trying to do. He said, everything will be all right if you'll just come out. <clears throat> Where are you finding your strength to say no to what Satan wants to do in your life? Where are you finding your strength to stop Satan in his tracks from tearing your families apart? To stop Satan in his tracks from tearing your life apart. To stop Satan from whispering in your ear, yeah, you don't need it. You're fine. Uh, just sleep a little longer. Uh, just, just go somewhere else. Uh, just read that book. You'll be fine. Just say a little prayer. You'll be okay. Where are you finding your strength to say no to this? It's funny how people will join the gym about this time of year. Amen. And they will make New Year's resolutions. <laughs> and they will say, I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to work out. And they find that when they come in, they want to do, because of people's opinions, they want to do whatever they think is the strongest. And nine times out of ten, they want to do legs. Because it's the strongest muscles in their body that believe, okay, well, I'm not going to stand out if I'm doing what everybody else is doing. I'm going to do something else. Ah! Amen. Amen. <laughs> he knows what I'm talking about. He's, he's seen the pain. <laughs> Amen. And people will come in there, Pat. And they will, they will start off something and then they'll get tired. And they'll start to hurt a little bit. And the strength that they were drawing on, the strength of a new resolution, goes out the window when, what is this moisture on my forehead? What is this redness? My skin is bleeding. There's something going on. I don't understand this. What is this soreness? I'm having a heart attack. Because they go into it ignorantly. They go into it not counting all the costs. I've got good news for you today. The Lord counted the cost. And he said, no, you are not able to stand on your own. But if you will rely on me, I'll help you to stand. Amen. And so my question to you this morning, and you can answer this truthfully to the Lord. Where are you finding your strength? Did your strength come from what's in the bank account? No. Nope. <laughs> that ain't going to get me very far. Does your strength come in your job? At least I have a job. Nope. Nope. Does your strength come in family bonds and family ties? Well, at least I've got a strong family. Even if it's just my immediate family. At least I've got that. Nope. Nope. Let me tell you something. If you find your strength in anything but Jesus Christ... You're wrong. Amen. I was talking to a guy not long ago. Man, he was proud and he was cocky. He thought that, oh, man. But I, I was tempted to throw a pin at him to see if it orbited him. Oh. He thought he was the center of the universe. <laughs> and I looked at this guy and I said, you know what? Nothing, there is nothing at all that's good about us. Nothing. Amen. Nothing at all is good about this guy that you see in front of you or people to let you right, except that Jesus Christ has done something for us. Amen. There is nothing that any of us can brag on except that Jesus Christ has done something for us. Amen. Is that Jesus Christ lives inside. Because you know what? 
I've witnessed many people die, many people laying on their deathbed, you know what, all of their accomplishments that they made, all of the big things that they had done, the things that they had built, the things that they had accumulated through their lives, when they were laying on their deathbed, you know what they wanted? They didn't want to see pictures of those things. They didn't want to jump out and, and I just want to see that. I, I just want to see that thing one more time. I want to see that person one more time. I want to see this relationship one more time. You know what was on their mind? Eternity was on their mind. The only thing that really mattered was did they know Jesus? That was it. So where are you finding your strength? That's the question. Number four and finally says this. What are you going to say? Verse number 18 says this. Beware lest Hezekiah persuade you to say, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nation... Wait a minute. Is Lord capitalized? Yes. Is God's capitalized? No. no. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Watch this. Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his... Delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria. Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Where are the gods of Sherephah? And have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands they have delivered out of their land, out of my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. But they held their peace. Did everybody say amen? Amen. And answered him not a word, for the king's command was saying, answer him not. I want you to understand this. You have choices to make. Amen. Get ready to dismiss. You have choices to make this afternoon. Before we leave here, you've got choices to make. Tonight, church starts at 6 o'clock. You've got choices to make. You're going to see people this afternoon. You're going to see friends. You're going to see family. You have choices to make. And you're going to choose what's important to you. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> And in the grand scheme of things, God is watching you and is listening to your choice. And if your choice is not God, then you've elevated something above God. Amen. Amen. It's plain and simple. So we need to really take a step back and say, you know what? The choices I make determine where God stands in my life. Amen. The choices I make determine where God stands in my life. What am I going to say to the Lord? I want God's blessings in my life. You do too. I want God's will in my life. You do too. I believe in a God that cannot fail. You do too. So what's the difference? The difference is a person that not only believes it, but lives it every day. And I'm not asking you to, to run with the horses. I'm asking you to walk with the foot. One foot in front of the other. Walking with God every day. Trust Him. It'll never get better, Jim. I've tried that before. It'll never get better. It's getting worse and worse and worse to the point where I just don't even know what I'm going to do next. Perfect. That's exactly what God wants you. Because when you're at the end of your road, that's when God begins. Amen. Sometimes the Lord has to allow you to get so low that the only place you get to see is up. Amen. That's right. And when you look up, it's there. Amen. Just bow your heads, please, and close your eyes. Sometimes you've said enough. Now it's just time to put it in action. And I want you to seriously, seriously and honestly answer these questions. Don't let this be another service. Don't let this be just another service. Okay, I sat through another service. There we go. Preacher's off my back for a little while at least. Let me tell you something. God loves you. I didn't know who would be here this morning, but he knew who would be here. And because he knew who would be here and he knew what we needed, I needed this too. He sent his message. Now, what are you going to do with it? It's like God set the table before you. He put the food on the plate. He picked up the spoon. And he's making airplane noises coming to your mouth. Are you going to eat? Are you going to eat? Are you going to take his word into your life and start living it? Or are you going to turn God down? Are you going to turn your back on God and walk away from him? The first question.
question I ask is, what are you leaning on? What are you putting your faith in? What do you, what, what do you think supporting you? What's holding you up? Your wheel can only make it so long before you collapse. You set your mind to this, that will only work for so long until you have a mental breakdown. You have to have something more. You have to have someone more. His name is Jesus. So the question I asked was, what are you leaning on? The psalmist said, hey, I'm leaning on the rock. You lean on a rock, you can pretty well count on it. It's going to be right there. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. If you need to adjust what you're leaning on, if you're leaning on some old dry rod of plastic lattice work, guess what? You will fall through. That's what a lot of things look like that we lean on a lot of times. If you're leaning on something other than Jesus Christ and you need him to adjust you a little bit, don't be ashamed, but be bold and lift your head up and say, pray for me. Amen. Amen. Yes, all across this church. Praise the Lord. Yes, all across this church. Hey, let me tell you something. It is not flesh and blood that has revealed that to you. It's the Holy Spirit. And if God's going to reveal that to you, he's not going to say, hey, listen, I'm going to show you something that needs to be fixed in your life, and I'm not going to fix it for you. No. He's going to help you fix it. Amen. One step at a time. How great is our God? And the Father who saw the hands were lifted, and Lord, we need to lean on the rock of Jesus Christ. And I ask you, Lord, to help those that have their hands up. Lord, replace their, their mental strength. Replace their physical strength. Replace all those friends or, or those self-help books or, or those talk shows that say, oh, you can do it all in your heart. Just be strong. Lord, replace all that with you. Let everything in our lives revolve around you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. The second question I had was this. Who are you listening to? There's a lot of voices out there. We got friends, we got family, we got TV. Oh, let me tell you something. And one of the biggest voices are our own minds. If you've been guilty of listening to the wrong voices and you want to listen to God's voice alone, you slip your hand up in my back. My hand's up too. No mind telling me. I'm guilty of that. I've listened to the wrong voices sometimes. I have. I have. And you know what? It's not about the past, though. It's about from this point on. Who am I going to listen to from this point on? I'm going to listen to Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you that right now. Listen, I've made the same decisions in the past that have led me to the same end. I'm ready to get off this carousel, going around and around and around, beating my head against the wall. I'm ready to get off and do the right thing. Because God is the only one that can help you. Heavenly Father, you saw the hands that were lifted. Lord, I ask you to move in our lives right now. And let us hear your voice alone. Lord, not the static of the world. Not the white noise of people around us. But Lord, let us hear you alone. In Jesus' name. The third question I have is this. Where are you finding your strength? Some of you have found your strength in family. You found your strength in friends. You found your strength in just a little emotional that helps you get through the day. But you're always finding yourself in need, in need, in need, and hurting, and down, and depressed. Because let me tell you something. That the vine is not where you're drawing your strength from. The true vine, Jesus Christ. If you're a branch and you're not connected to the true vine, let me tell you something. You're not receiving what you need. So if you need God to graft you back in, oh, hallelujah. If you need God to make a little cutting in the vine and graft your branch back in so that you can receive that health, that nourishment, that hope, that peace, and that love, oh, hallelujah. He wants to do it right now. Where are the hands this morning that say, hey, I need it. I need it right now. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, you see these hands. You know the ones that are going up in their hearts right now. Lord, graft us back in. Lord, feed us from the table of God. Feed us with the bread of life. Lord, let your Holy Spirit nourish us and let us grow in you. Lord, let us find our strength in you so that when it's all said and done, we can say, it is God who has been in my family. It is God who has been in my work. It is God who has been in my finances. It is God who has kept us together. It's God that's the reason that I have a bigger capacity right now. It's God who's the reason I have peace in my life right now. Lord, it's you.
you and only you. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, let your spirit fall on all of us here. 